Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I am an instructor and captain on ATR aircraft. And today we have Q&A number 11 and I will answer the following questions. Why do we add 30 or 50 feet to MDA on an approach chart, but nothing to DA, decision altitude? We will compare how an ATR is to land with a an, uh, CRJ. And I will answer how does the outside air temperature affect engine power at takeoff, and likewise, how does uh, use of uh, air condition affect the engine power. I will explain two sounds you can hear in some of my videos, and finally, I will explain how an aircraft can fly upside down. Okay, let's go into it. Number one. Thank you, Magnar, for the nice videos. May I ask why you have to add 30 or 50 feet to the MDA slash H on a non-precision approach? Can the instrument flight procedure designer not simply add this margin to the published MDA slash H so you as a pilot no longer need to do it? Thank you. The procedure designer does not define the minima. The procedure designer will uh, published what they call the obstacle clearance altitude slash height. And this is found on the charts in the AIP, Aeronautical Information Publication. And then it's up to the operator to decide the operative minima based on this. Um, most companies, they will use Jeppesen charts as they, have a, they cover all airports in the world. And if you, for example, look at an air approach into Bangkok, RNP runway 0 one left, you will see the OCA is 400 feet. And when you look at the approach chart, it shows El Navi now, decision altitude 400. When you see decision altitude, it means you do not have to add anything. For El now, it's written 600 feet, but look, it's showing DH or MDA. So here, there's an option, and it's written in the comments. We know the edge in Leo of MDA it depends on operator policy. So now it's up to the operator to decide whether you want to add 30 feet or 50 feet to your approach. And also, some companies flying ATRs they will add 30 feet, which is uh, normal according to EASA. But some companies will add 50 feet because they have a mixed fleet, maybe they also have uh, larger jets who need 50 feet. So they keep it simple as every add 50 feet. So therefore, it's up to the operator to decide. And of course, you have to follow the regulations in the country you are. They can also vary. Okay. Next, in the CRJ, when reducing throttle to idle during landing, the nose pitches automatically up a little due to the design of the airplane. Is it similar in the ATR? Thanks. No, it's not. The CRJ had engine mounted quite high up, so when you, you reduce power, there will be a force pitching the nose slightly up. Opposite, you increase power, it will force the nose a little down. On ATR, the propeller slipstream produces a lot of lift. So when we reduce the power in the flare, this lift starts to disappear. And that means the aircraft starts to lose altitude and you have to compensate by pulling. Not much, but you have to compensate. Next. Hi Magna, can I explain the takeoff torque bag computation on the engine OAT page on the VCP? How does it affect the takeoff torque rating if you adjust the ground SIT up or down? So OAT and SIT are outside air temperature or static air temperature, they are the same. So if I adjust that up or down, what happens to the torque? Um, the torque, engine torque, depends on uh, density altitude. Up to a certain limit, it's flat rated to 90% torque. But as it gets warmer, for example, uh, I will explain it in the next question, by the way. Um, then you will have a different power. So sometimes you can listen to the 80s at the airport and the temperature is 30 degrees and you look at the TAH of 34, for example. And that means uh, the torque value will uh, be reduced. And so you can set in a manual temperature and then you can see the power you expect to have at takeoff. 
Uh, I never done it because once you enter the runway, the temperature is what you will experience during takeoff, right? And the torque will adjust itself to the temperature. And uh, next, hello, Magnai. I have a question about air high flow. The FCOM states that the pack valve controls the airflow, normal 22 psi and high 30 psi. If airflow is only controlled by the pack valve, why does it affect engine torque when you select high flow, reducing torque engine produces? Does it bleed more air from the LP or HP compressor? I could not find more info in the FCOM, thanks. The push button label normal and high controls the airflow, and this air is coming from the compressors of the engine. At low engine power, it receives uh, the air condition packs receive air from the high pressure compressor, and at high power from the low pressure compressor. And this is relatively high pressure, so the pack valve controls the airflow, the air pressure of the bleeder going into the packs, 22 or 30, depending on the normal or high airflow. And this air steals air from the engine, which cannot be used to power the aircraft. So you will typically lose 5% torque by selecting the bleed on a takeoff. For example, the pressure altitude at an airport is 2000 feet static air temperature. The outside air temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. With bleed off, we can get 88.8% .8 torque. If we keep the bleed on, we have 83.7% torque. And the high flow will then steal even more air from the engine, so you have even less power. And therefore, we never use high flow for takeoff. And whether we use uh, bleed on or off for takeoff, it depends on how much power we need. There's also a company policy here. Okay. Question about sounds. During the clip of a landing at the end of many videos, there is a beep 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 noise close to when the plane touches down. Is this associated with a mode setting or possibly if the trim button on the yoke is being used? Warbling woo 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 noise of varying lengths in flight seems to be while getting stabilized before landing. Sounds a little like the variometer on a sailplane or glider. What is that indicating? Um, to answer the last one first, when we extend the flaps, the aircraft tend to pitch up. And to compensate for that, the autopilot will trim the nose down, so we stay on the approach profile. And when the pitch trim is running for more than one second, we hear that woo 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 sound. The other sound, which I call the tick tick tick, it's um, an uh, indication that a change of a mode on the autopilot. In this case, the auto speed is disabled. 40, 30, 20, 10. I have made a video about all those sounds and all that, and you will find a link to this video below. Okay, next. Hello, Captain, for your next Q&A. My question is, have you ever flown the first ever ATR-4272? Uh, not the very first. The very first ATR to fly was the 42200. But uh, the, that was only two prototypes. I have flown the 42300, and uh, the 320, which were the first production models. The only difference between them is 100 horsepower more in the 320. And why is it called 300 or 200? Where is the 100? Well, I have a video about that as well. So you find the link below. Um, and finally, then how do airplanes fly upside down? There are two important factors to remember here. And the first is, lift is defined as a force acting in opposite of the gravity. 
So when you're flying horizontal, the lift is acting up, yes, but when you turn the aircraft upside down, you still need lift to act up, opposite of the surface of the earth. And the second is angle of attack. Most of the lift it create, is created because the wing is angled and with a certain angle against the wind. And that is the angle of attack. And if you notice on this picture, three aircraft are flying upside down. Notice how high the nose is compared to the other aircraft. That's because they need a higher angle of attack when flying upside down. I will make a video about it. I just started writing on it, so in one or two weeks it should be ready. Okay, that is all for this time. I hope you liked the video. If you have more questions, write them down below here and I will answer them. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.